All right, I am making this recording to go over some basics of R and the way that R speaks, the languaging that we're going to use to type our code, and some tips and tricks for getting started. So these things that we're going to go over are on a set of slides that are available on our website, our class website. So I'm starting off in Canvas and we have our little hexagon links here. And the first one, remember, goes to my website. The second one goes to the class website. The third one goes to the encyclopedia. And then the last one goes to the YouTube page. So I'm gonna go into Statistical Foundations, the class website. And scrolling down, we have the chapters that we're covering in the Cohen textbook. Oh, a BP textbook. The Cohen textbook. And so the stuff that I'm going to go over right now is not in the textbook because remember the textbook, ha each chapter has an A, B, and C section. A introduces, B is the meat. In the textbook, section C is how to do stuff with SPSS. Instead of that, we're replacing it with R. And so there's a set of slides here getting started with R and that's what I want to turn our attention to. So there's some slides that are in HTML and if you click on that, it should bring up the slides. Again, if for any reason you want to print these out to keep in a binder, folder, or make notes on, once you have them up in your web browser, you can print them from here, but at least this is in Windows, make sure that you go into your settings and choose to have more than one sheet per page. So for instance, you could do four and it will arrange them to fill the page, or you could do two or six if you want them really, really small. So that's how you can print them again. So we're gonna do getting started with R, the basics of R. So we've already gone over how to download R, R Studio and LaTeX. And here's the, a link to the Encyclopedia Volume Zero that goes over all of those steps and the links to get those. So a reminder, R is like the engine, is what's going to do the work, but our studio is like our cockpit, our steering wheel, our pedals, a comfortable seat to work in. And so we've gotten both of those two programs, R, plain R, we're not opening, we already got that, and our studio, that's what we will be opening. We're going to focus on what you need, not everything that R can do. I want to give you the basic building blocks the foundation so you can take it in any direction. But again, we're just doing the foundation. And I wanna remind you that your success or how easy this feels, that success is not magical or mysterious. It's only a consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals, it's that buildup of experience. So we are, it's like we're learning to swim here and we're not going to go into the kiddie pool and splash around. We are diving headfirst into the deep end and we're just going to doggy paddle and keep our head above water. And before you know it, you're going to be swimming. So this is a lot of information really quickly, but I'm going to give you lots of examples and show you me show have you watch me doing coding. And little by little, we're going to add pieces together. Now, there's no way to ease in. So it will be a lot up front. So reasons why we're using R, it's freely available. You can have it on any computer you want without having to buy and find and keep up another license. You can always keep it up to date. It is by far the best software out there for data visualization for making plots and figures. It is syntax oriented, not button pushing, which requires a little bit of learning up front, a little bit of a learning curve. However, it's going to pay off in the end. Um, it always annoyed me teaching SPSS with this book. For the first half of the book, it teaches how to do SPSS with point and click. And then about, oh, I don't know, about midway through, you get to chapter and, and all of a sudden Barry Cohen says, uh, yeah, so this thing we need to know how to do now, you can't do it with the button pushing, the menus. To do a little bit more, you have to go to syntax. And he's like, oh yeah, SPSS can do syntax. You didn't know? Well, now I'm telling you. And he proceeds to then teach syntax in SPSS because syntax is the only way to have full control and to do the more interesting things. So R is staying updated, SPSS. Um, IBM is letting it die a slow, painful death. And um, 
another good thing is you can make custom functions in R to do really great things. Like here is an example of the table one function. And by just putting very little bit of information into this table one function, you can make this beautiful APA um, table. And we're going to learn how to do that. So there are issues that can come up with R. There is that learning curve. Some people think that there's too much. They don't want to learn it all. The good news is you don't have to. And once in a while, you might run into a colleague or an advisor that doesn't use R and doesn't want to use R and it has a pretty negative attitude. And if that happens to you, I'd be welcome to have a conversation with you and the person that you're dealing with. Um, because really when it comes down to it, software is just a tool. And everyone's going to have a preference on SPSS, SAS, Data, R, MATLAB, Mathematica, Maple. There's a ton of programs out there. And um, I've done a lot of thinking, a lot of researching, a lot of years working with these different programs. And where I've arrived at this conclusion, and I'm not the only one. So the way I see it is that the pros far outweigh the cons with R, and it can end up saving you a lot of time in the long run. So here's a little bit of soapbox. Um, if you do an analysis in SPSS, the button pushing way, with just through the menus, you're going to get output that's about 50 pages long. Okay, you can weed through it, you get done, you write your results up, and then... You share it with a colleague, a mentor, a journal, submit it for publication and reviewers comment back, or you submit a grant and you get reviewers, you always will have feedback and you'll have to go back and change. Well, what would happen if we added another variable or check out this variable, or we need to add some more participants or wait, we need to exclude people over age 10 or something's going to come up and you're going to want to change something and rerun it. And I will tell you from experience, trying to rerun analysis in SPSS and other button pushing becomes very tedious. You can't remember what you did or how many things did I check this? Did I not? What are so many options to check? When you use syntax, whatever language it is, you leave yourself a bread, breadcrumb trail. So you have transparent, reproducible proof of what you did, and you can go back copy, paste, edit, rerun, and push the rerun button. And it ends up saving you hours, days, and even weeks of time down the road. So we're going to pay the price now so that we can have the benefits down the road. <sighs> Speech over. Okay. We're going to talk about um, what kinds of words and phrases are used how and how they're built up in R. So we're going to start with the Basics first, nouns and verbs. Just like English, it's not French, it's not Portuguese, but it's close. It's a different language. The nouns are things that are person, place, or thing. That's the definition of a noun. They're objects. And in R, an object is usually data. It's a set of information. A static set of information is a, a object. This can be an object that's like one number or a list of numbers. And we use a special storage container for these pieces of information. If you have a one dimensional listing or group of values, we call this a vector. And this is mathematical language. I'm going to try hard not to say list because a list means something different in R, but a vector is a concatenated, grouped together bunches of pieces of information. I mean, it could be zero, but usually it's it's a variable. It's a set of values, is a vector. Where a data frame is a set of vectors the same length. So there's this word that starts with the C, concatenate. Concatenate means to combine. It's like you're combining or gluing a bunch of numbers together. And we do that in R with the letter C. So you can see down here I have the letter C and then in parentheses I have some numbers, there's some odd numbers here that are separated with commas. If I was to run this or execute this in R, R would say, ah, this is a vector of the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. That's a vector. It's a one dimensional set of combined or concatenated values. Similar is a data frame. 
Now notice this data frame, this new thing. It's data dot frame. A data frame is a set of vectors of the same length. So here I have one, my first vector is x, and it is the concatenation or the combination of the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, the first four odd numbers. Then my vector y is the numbers 2, 4, 6, 8 combined together. So x is my vector of odd numbers, y is my vector of even numbers. Now when I put them together as a data frame, it makes a grid or a matrix. And so I can, here I've got the list of one through four, those are the row numbers. And I've got vector one is this column or stack of X and next to it is vector Y and there's those even numbers. So this is a two dimensional group of values. Vector is one dimension, just basically a bunch of numbers together a data frame is several vectors together. So that's how you can enter the easiest, most basic way to enter information values into the global environment, the brain of R. But to be able to do something with those values, you have to save those objects in, by giving them a name. And the way we assign either ve values individually, vectors can combine together, or a data frame combining the vectors of values, the way we combine those to, after we build that to store it, we have to assign it a name. And we do it with this um, assignment symbol. It's an arrow, but it's not one key on your keyboard. To make this assignment operator, this arrow, we do the less than symbol and then next to it, a dash to make this combination. So we're using two characters smushed together with no spaces to make an arrow that assigns a value. So if I open up R, here's my R, and I'm gonna work in the console for a second. So I don't have a script file here, so I've just got my three panels. So I'm gonna go over here in the console, I can say, I can concatenate, so that's letter C and then parentheses, some numbers, one, two, three, four, five. First five digits are my concatenation. If I hit enter, just, there's your numbers. But if we look over on the left side, our environment is still empty. This time, in front of my concatenation of numbers, I am gonna put the assignment arrow pointing to a name, and I'm gonna call this list of numbers Bob because why not? One, two, three, four, five. So again, I put the name, Bob, and then I put the arrow, the less than dash, to point to Bob, because Bob is where I'm gonna store this concatenations of the numbers one through five. Now when I hit enter, it's going to give me a new cursor. But if we look over now in our global environment, we now have, it says we have saved Bob as the numbers, and we've got one through five, one, two, three, four, five. Now I could save Sally, let's do 10, 20, 30, 30, 40. Now I have Sally, it's a list of four numbers, 10, 20, 30, 40. This brings up some things. The assignment arrow has to be smushed together with no spaces. But other than making a single symbol out of multiple characters, you can put spaces to separate things pretty much anywhere. I cannot put spaces in a name. It, you, names of things can't have spaces, but other than that, names of, names of things can't have spaces, assignment operator can't have spaces, but other than that, I could say Sally, and I could put several spaces, no spaces, I could even put it, well, if I put an enter, it thinks it's done. So, and it doesn't didn't like that because I had a comma leading to nothing. Commas always have to separate things, so you can't have a comma and close a parentheses with anything else. So now I have saved the, now the numbers one, two, four 
on the same num name as Sally. So my original Sally that was 10, 20, 30, 40 is gone because I've saved something else as that same name. This assignment or naming process is how we store things in our global environment or the brain, the active brain of R. And it's a, so we can save a constant, which is a single value, or we can save a concatenated list. We can also save a data frame. Let's, let's make our own data frame here for kicks and giggles. Let's call it DF for data frame because I'm not very imaginative. And data dot frame. And I want my first vector or my first variable to be the concatenated list of, let's see, I'm going to have person 101, 102, 103 in my study. Oh, it didn't like that. And then their ages, oh, people in my study are going to be 40, 44, and 37. Notice now it's put this DF data frame that I created in the global environment. It's separated values are constants. I could say, let's see, I'm going to make Fred be the number 13, unlucky. So single values like Fred being just the number 14, 13 and vectors that are concatenated groups of values both get put under this heading of values. Data frames get put under a heading called data. And if I put an arrow down, it will tell me that I have two vectors or two variables in my data frame. My first vector is ID and it's the numbers 101, 102, 103. And my ages are numbers 40, 44, and 37. It knows that I have three observations and two variables. So let's talk about data frames. Data frames, you have one row per observation. So usually that means one row per participant, per person, per subject. Columns up and down, vec our vectors are variables. That's called tidy data. Most analysis works better if you have tidy data. And when we say that, we mean one row per person, one column per measurement or type of measurement or variable, whether it's nominal, categorical, ordinal, interval ratio, continuous, whichever type it is. Okay, let's go back to the notes. There. Okay, oh, I wanted to show you one thing. If I, now I have all these things saved in my global environment, in my console, I can ask to print each one. So I can put DF, and it'll print out my data frame. And I can see that I have three rows, one for each person and two variables. The first variable is the ID number for the person. And the second is ages. Now, you're not gonna enter most real life data this way because it would take you too long. We're gonna read in from Excel, but I'm showing you how things work in the global environment. Now I can ask for Fred and it knows Fred is 13. I can ask for Bob. It's the list of the numbers one through five. I can ask for Sally. It's the numbers one, two, four. So that's how things are stored in R, in the global environment. That's like the brain. Now, when I make a data frame, a row per each person, the columns or variables can have different types. So here's one that has four variables. The first variable is the ID. The second is the name, the third is the age, and the fourth is whether or not they're in treatment or control. We're gonna call this group A, group B. Here I've just made a, a little temporary or example data set that has four people and four variables. Now, I want you to look at these. The ID variable, those are all numbers. The name, that's all characters or text. Age, that's numbers again. Treatment, it's letters, it's text, but there's only the possibility for A and B. So the language that we're gonna use in R is for number variables, we're gonna call them numeric. And it would be nice if they were just 
the abbreviation for numeric was num. Wouldn't that be nice? But um, again, hearkening back to old computer code, lingo, and way of thinking about things, the way that numbers are stored is they're stored as a double floating point decimal, is what I've been told. So that's why the abbreviation for numeric is DBL. So DBL means double floating point decimals. Now, if we come back to R, Notice how under the data frame it says dollar sign ID and dollar sign age. The way that we pull out a variable of a data set is we use the dollar sign. So if I say DF, it's going to give me the whole data frame. But if I say DF dollar sign ID, it will only give me the IDs. Or DF dollar sign ages, it'll just give me the ages. So if I say DFID, it'll just give me the values of the IDs. Now we can ask our what classification is each variable. So I can ask what's the class of the DF data frames variable ages. It's numeric. What's the class of the DF data frames variable ID? It's numeric. Numeric means it's a number. That assumes this interval ratio, and we can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and all those great things. So both of those are. Now in this data set here, check out the variable name. The name of the person is stored as quoted text. Quoted text is not a number. And if you ask what the class, the type of variable, that it is, it will tell you character, and its abbreviation is reasonable, it's CHR. CHR means character. Now there's lots of data that can be stored as character type. Um, names are a good example. There is a limitation for statistics. You cannot do any um, statistics with text data. Lots of qualitative things you can do, and some descriptive things, but you cannot add, subtract, multiply, divide, find the mean, find the standard deviation of text data. So we're not going to use that a lot. So I want you to look at this TRT variable. TRT is our variable that is A's and B's. But notice how it was enter. Instead of just the concatenate, that's been surrounded by another thing, and it says as dot factor. That tells R that this text, A and B, should be treated as a factor. This is telling it it's a categorical variable, and A's and B's, that's all it could be. It couldn't be a C in this case. So if I ask what's the class of the treatment variable, it will tell me factor, and its abbreviation as FCT. Now this is really important because factors is how we should store categorical variables as a factor, not a number. Not, not a number and not a character. And we're going to do a lot with factors in this class because they're very frequent. So that's how we store or um, how we define and classify nouns, objects, the data, constant values, vectors, and data frames. Now let's talk about what we're going to do with our nouns. So functions are verbs. Verbs do action. So anytime we have an action we want to do, we're going to actually use a function. And the way we use a function is we have the name of the function, and then we put parentheses, and inside the parentheses we put the arguments that say, tell the function how it should act or what it should act on. Now, there are times when anyone who writes a function gives it a name, and there are times when different people will use the same name. So foot, play football and play football. It might mean something different in the United States versus some different in Brazil. So just because I say play football, it doesn't really tell us which football we should play. And so we could use an argument or the function could be built a different way. So Sometimes this happens really easily with words that are common, like select. There are lots of functions that are called select, and they're going to do different things, and they're going to expect different input, and they're going to give different output. So to specify 
specifically and to be transparent, we want to name the package from which the function comes, what it belongs to. So I will use the names of functions by themselves if a function comes from base R, because you can't not have base R. But if we're gonna use a function that's coming from a different package, I'm gonna specify it by pre preceding the name of the function with the name of the package and you separate them with two colons. So it's like four dots. Here's an example. Something really common we wanna do in statistics is find the average, the mean. The function mean is in base R. You already have it on your computer the first time you downloaded it. So let's go back to our example Bob. Bob was the numbers one through five. I can ask what's the mean of Bob? And it's gonna automatically add up all those numbers and divide by five and give me the answer of three. I can say what's the mean of Sally? And it's gonna add up the numbers one, two, four, that's seven, and divide by three. And so a function is going to do something. The mean function is going to find the average of whatever you give it. Now the nice thing in R is everything has a help page. So we've already seen in this lower right hand corner, we've files, plots, packages, I'm gonna to go to the help menu. And by the magnifying glass, I'm gonna type the function name mean. I hit enter. Now every function ha that's in any package that goes through CRAN has to have a help page. They're always set up the same way. At the top, as we read across, we see the name of the function mean, and then in curly braces, it tells us it's in base. That means base R that we got. And the name is the, does the arithmetic mean. So it's a generic function for the, and you can apply trimming, but a mean. Trimming is where you throw out the top and bottom X percent. So it tells us the default usage and the arguments that we can put in those parentheses. Now, the first thing inside those parentheses is the letter X. And down below in the arguments, it says X has to be an R object. So we have to give the function mean, that's a verb, we have to give it an object. We have to do the mean of something. So we give it the values we want to find the mean of. And it tells us there are methods for numeric or logical vectors and dates, but we can't give it text or else it won't know what to do. Um, we're not going to trim anything most of the time. And so by default, it says trim equals zero. So I'm old. I remember back in the Olympics in things like figure skating and gymnastics, there used to be like 10 judges and they would all give their scores and the top, the lowest and the highest, they'd throw those two out and average the rest to make the comp competitor score. That's what trimming does is throw out the top and the bottom. And you can put throw out up to 50%, that would be leaving nothing. So throw out 10%, it'll get rid of the top and bottom 5%. Um, and then we're gonna learn about this option in a second. So, so a function has to be given arguments, to something to act on. And so we can do the mean of a data frame's variable age. And it's mean is in base R. So if we were going to precede, precede the name of the function with this package name, we'd say base. That's the only time I'm not going to precede the function name is if it was going to be base or stats, because those are base R packages. So a verb is a function. A function usually takes in an object and it spits out. We have some input and we're going to give some output. And then arguments are other things to inform the function how to perform. And 99% of the time, we're going to input a data frame and get out either a data frame or some other set of results. And so that is the tidy way of defining functions. The very first thing you put in the parentheses for the function is the name of the data frame on which you want to act. And then we follow that with other arguments. So here I'm going to save a data frame. It's the same one as before, but look really carefully. What? is different. Here, I'll highlight it for you. Third person in our data frame, which would be Meg, subject 102, who's in treatment A, we didn't collect her age. This happens all the time in real life data. If you are missing a value, we need to leave a spot for it so it doesn't slide the ages up. Because remember, every variable has to be the same length. So we need filler values for missing. 
Now in Excel, it uses a blank cell. In SPSS, it will often look like it has a period in the cell. But in R, we fill empty cells with the special set of letters, N, A, for not applicable. Now I want you to look at the text names, names, text, always quoted. Factor text, always quoted. N, A, the filler value, no quotes. It's just plain N, A. It's a special meaning. If you type N, A, it will probably color it different in our studio because it knows that NA stands for the missing value placeholder. So if I change my data set to this and I ask it for the mean of the data frames variable age, it's gonna also tell me NA. And the reason is the default behavior of the function mean is that it's going to add up all the values and divide by however many there are. And if there's a missing one, it's going to not do that. It's going to let you know there's a missing value. Now there's a way to override that. You can add an argument that says, you know those NA values? Just go ahead and remove them. So if we look in R at our help menu, in our usage, we can just do the mean of an object or we can give it some more things, things like how much percentage we want to trim. And the other option is na.rm. Now it says it's a logical value. A logical value means it has to be true or false. Only two options. So we can say na.rm is true or na.rm is false. The default behavior, if we look here, it says na.rm is false. So it's not going to remove those missing values default. So if you do want to ignore the missing values, you have to add in the option, the argument, na.rm equals true, so that it will truly remove the missing values. And then if you do that, it will only add up the non-missing values and divide by however many non-missing values there are. So here at the age variable, we have 10, nine and a half and 11. So when we do the mean, just letting it do its default, it says can't do it, there's one that's missing. That's why the average is missing as well. But if we add in the option, the argument to remove the missings, true, and then it's just going to add up these three numbers and divide by three, ignoring that NA. So just like NA is not quoted because it's special meaning text, true and false are never quoted. They're just special text. And you'll notice that the special text here, the NA, the true, and the false, never quoted and always capitals. I think true and false will work if they're lowercase, but that's like bad voodoo to do in R. It's considered a no-no. So don't quote and always capitalize NA, true, and false. And then this option, remove or ignore the missing values, is in a lot of different functions we're going to run into. So um, base R, some functions that you'll want to know that we're going to use in the homework, is DIM. Now, capitalization makes all the difference in R. A capital letter and Capital D and a lowercase d, completely different letters. If you're used to working in SPSS, SPS and SAS and M plus are blind to capitalization. They don't care whether you capitalize every other letter or all of them or none of them, same thing. R does care about capitalization. And you're going to probably struggle with it. I still struggle with it after 20 years. There are five kind of mistakes you're gonna find yourself making. I still do every day. And because I'm aware of it, I always look for them. Every time I get an error, these are the first five things I look at. Capitalization, spelling, commas, missing or extra, parentheses, always have to have partners, they're always twinners, open and close, and something called a pipe, either missing or going somewhere to nowhere. We'll talk about that. Those are the five typos that are going to cause errors nine times out of ten. So again, capitalization, not being right, spelling, not being right, and again, dyslexic here, big ones, capitalization, spelling, commas missing or um, need to be added, parentheses, we've got some, one without a partner, and 
pipe, either needing another one or having one too many. Okay. So dim is a function that tells us the dimensions. So this tells us our data frame is four, four. That means four rows, four columns. It harkens back to mathematics where we always say the number of rows first and then the number of columns across in a matrix. The other function that's really handy is names. Names, when you give it a data frame, will tell you what the variable names are. So dimensions will tell you how many rows and columns in a data set. Names will tell you the names of the variables. And um, because anytime we have data, we want to see it. We want to know what our data is. The other one we're going to use a lot is called glimpse. Glimpse gives us all of this and more. It tells us how many rows and columns. It tells us all the variable names listed with the dollar sign preceding it, the type of variable they each are, and the first few values until your screen runs out. Okay, so, whew, let's go a little bit more. Let's go a little bit more. Okay, this huge old slide, you'll notice has a lot of hexagons on it. Remember, we use hexagons usually for a logo for a package. All of these packages that are displayed on this figure are different packages that belong to what's called the tidyverse. This is the universe of packages that work well for tidy data, where all the functions take in first a data frame and then optional arguments and then output either another data frame or some results. And they all function the same way. And this is what makes working with R so easy because there's a consistency to all of these packages and all of the functions and they're all named in a way that helps remember what things do pretty good so the ones we're going to use a lot is over on the the right left side these blue ones these are packages that help us get data imported into r read excel is what we're going to use today that's for reading in excel packages Haven is good for reading in SPSS, SAS, and Stata. I've used all three this week even. And then Read R is another package for reading in miscellaneous like text files, CSVs, JSON files, even SQL files. Once we get the data into R, we'll often have to tidy it up. And so we're going to use the tibble function and sometimes the tidy R function. If we want to program or do stuff, we're going to use the pipe and the pipe is this weirdo tan hexagon it's a percentage greater than percentage and we'll get to that but that's a combination of symbols that mean do something kind of like the assignment operator it's a linking step then it, when we manipulate our data we're going to use the d plier and you see a, a picture of some pliers pliers do work d is for data so the d plier package helps us work with our data. Things like filter, select, arrange, mutate, summarize. So that's how we like work our data into the arrangement we need it. Then once we have our data manipulated the way we want to, that's not like faking it, but like restructuring it, formatting it a little bit, then we can either visualize or transform it some more and then model it. So we're gonna use ggplot for almost all of our plots. We'll use four cats, you know this little kitty cats, for working with categorical variables. The string R package is for working with text. And the lubridate function is working for time and date variables, which we aren't gonna use very much, but can come in real handy. Uh, we won't use much broom. R markdown and knitter is how we make our PDF documents at the end. And then shiny, we're not gonna get into, but that's how you make online um, dashboards and interactives. Oh, this video is getting long. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna make another video because we need to have a breather. But I would like to invite you to learn more about the Tidyverse with this link here. This is a lecture slideshow and it has a ton of stuff in it. You're not gonna be able to go over it in 10 minutes and you don't need to do it today or even this week. But if you want to know more, this is a good place to go. So I'm gonna stop here and then later in about an hour, I'm going to come back and make another video with some more, um, the rest of these slides, there's about, we're almost halfway through and then get into doing the homework.